Uh, Mr. Addy over there, so that means we are uh, live. I will call the meeting to order. This is our June 12th work session meeting that is in preparation for our June 16th meeting of Tuesday. And we have a, a rather full work session agenda this morning. We are very fortunate we have, we're have we going to have the opportunity to interview a couple folks who are interested in our park and recreation uh, position that we retain in our effort to uh, keep a couple of positions um, viable. Uh, the pandemic caused us to uh, cease hiring, but there were two positions that were critical to our future, and this is one of them. And so we have first Mr. Craig Dolan is uh, on the screen here, and we will we'll start with him here in just a second. But uh, one of the things that uh, I wanted to say that was news to us per this morning is that our sales tax numbers are in, and we can celebrate that they're only down 33% because <laughs> <laughs> the anticipation was that they were going to be down much more dramatically than that. So um, that is that is relatively good news and I'm excited about that. Now that we'll see what happens next month, but uh, that, is a, that is a nice way to start off what is a beautiful Friday and uh, hopefully a, a beautiful weekend. So, all right, with that in mind, uh, Mr. Dolan, we have you up first. Are you, uh, are you unmuted? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, as everybody knows, we have um, advertised for this position. They have put that out on the out on the website and, and the various and sundry other locations that would draw in the best candidates. And we have Mr. Dolan has uh, is taking a look at the city of Starkville and we at him. So looking forward to that, Mr. Dolan. If you would like to make any kind of opening comments, you're welcome to do that now. Sure. Um, thank you all very much for uh, taking the time out of your work session to speak with me. Um, Currently reside in Florida, um, outside of Tampa Bay. Uh, run a recreation department in Tarpon Springs. It's a small coastal community. Um, we have more water than land, it seems like. So uh, we got news the other day that they actually took our uh, community shelter out because it would be in a flood zone now, it's considered. So we actually have zero shelters, hurricane shelters in town. So that all the residents now have to go out of town. So that was some big news for us. but. Um, I've been doing my current position here in recreation in Tarpon for the last seven years. Uh, we've seen our department grow. We've done a lot of renovations on our building, which um, is 40 years old. So that, that's been a big accomplishment for us here. Um, one thing I'm very proud of, I am from New Jersey. So I, I like to say that I was born and raised in New Jersey. So I, I talk fast sometimes, but I work very hard. So, um, but another big thing that drew me to Starkville is uh, my wife's family are graduates of Mississippi State. Oh, so, oh yes. <laughs> Thumbs up on that one. It, it's very good. Um, my favorite baseball team are the Mets, and they just drafted JT Ginn last night, which was, uh, it was, it was very nice to hear that. Um, I have a love-hate relationship also because Dak Prescott is on the Cowboys, and I'm a Giants fan, so that, that's always hard to swallow, but when he does well, it's good to root for him. But again, on the same side, I'm like, wow, he's on the Cowboys. So th those are two things that are, I'm passionate about sports. Um, I, I've been doing recreation now for 15 plus years. Um, I had the great opportunity for working for Naval Air Station Jacksonville right out of college. And that was an incredible job. Um, from there, I went back and got my master's degree in sports manager and recreation. And then I came in and I started to work for the city of Largo, which has a population of about 80,000. So there I worked from teenagers all the way up to the senior population. I like to call the young at heart. Um, so I did that for a few years. And most recently I'm here in Tarpon Springs. So I've been uh, just overseeing our recreation department here, making sure all our special events go well, all our programming and just uh, leading my team and hopefully letting them do the best they can do without having to step in so much. Okay. Hopefully that gives a brief summary of me. All right. Well, excellent. Thank you so much. Well, I, I'm going to start off with a couple of questions of my own because I'm, uh, what is the uh, population of Tarpon Springs? 25,000. 25,000. Oh, okay. Awesome. Then that's kind of where we are as well. Okay. And then you won me over with NAS Jacks. I'm no, I'm former Navy. So, Good on you. I did uh, read up on that. That was impressive. Yeah, well, well 
Okay, well, never mind about that. But uh, I, I am assuming that you have read up on us. And in that case, you are aware that we are going to do or we have a sports tournament and recreation facility that we're going to be working to um, construct and then to obviously to put into into use, into good use. Um, yes, have you done construction? Have you done any construction projects overseeing yes. them, been part of them? Um, I would that a little bit? In the city of Largo, we built a brand new $10 million LEED certified building um, back in 2010. And I was for our community center, which I was part of. So I was from start to finish in that process from design phase all the way to completion. So I, I got to see the ins and outs of it. Um, most recently, uh, I oversee all our building projects at our main community center building. So we built new showers. Right now we're going through a hardening project for hurricanes. Um, updating our hurricane shelter. So today, this morning, I have to meet with construction workers to go over our um, up upgrading our current hurricane shelter from a category one to a category three, just because it doesn't meet the needs of the new Florida building codes. So um, we were in talks uh, building a pool in town. So I was able to go through um, USA Swimming's build a pool conference, and I was able to do the construction side of that all through the planning and designing of that facility. Um, we were in talks with MLS soccer to bring major league soccer to Tarpon Springs as another uh, location. Cause we have one right down the road in Oldsmar. So um, we were discussing how to renovate our current complex, our sports complex um, at the time it didn't come to fruition. So that was, that's on pause, but um, so I haven't had the, Full, I guess, complex build construction side of it's more been buildings. Okay, all right. Um, well, obviously, buildings will be a part of our uh, sports tournament facility and recreation facility, um, and we're in the very early stages of that right now. So, um, and the other thing, obviously, you heard us kind of dialoguing about uh, budget constraints, um, and and every that's a nationwide issue now. But clearly, for a, a community of a university and and re someone that relies on people coming into our community for events and, and athletic events associated with the university, we are looking at, at what's going to be a, a shortfall. And so from a budgeting standpoint, have you have you begun to pre prepare for your your uh, city right now with that in mind? Because that's where we will be as well. What are your yes, thoughts? Yes, ma'am. Um, we, we, we've already submitted all our budgets, you know, our initial budgets here um, back in March. Um, I had a large capital improvement project that I was told to cut. So I went from 350,000 down to 25 right now because it wasn't necessities. So we, we have been working on cutting our budgets and just um, looking to save as much money as possible because again, our revenue is down here. We can't sit summer camp here in town. So we're, we're down in revenue across the board. Um, yeah. the positive here in town is we produce our own water. So, our overall revenue stream is still coming in strong on the city total across the city, but in recreation, our revenue is down. Okay. Well, and that's where our deepest cuts were in, in terms of furloughing uh, our employees was in the parks and rec, obviously. So, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through our aldermen here and let them each one ask questions that they're particularly interested in. So first I'll start, I'll go one to two and, and Mr. Carver, uh, Alderman Carver is not up. Is that correct? Okay, so Alderman Sistrunk, who she's Ward 2, and we'll let her ask questions. And two, two of our larger, I'm talking to the iPad like okay. you're there. Um, <laughs> two of our larger parks are um, in my ward. Uh, the Sportsplex and McKee Park are, are in my ward. And I guess technically the new park, uh, the tournament facility will be in my ward. So in addition to having that interest, I'm, I sit as the budget chair. So I'm going to ask you a couple of money questions. Um, what size budget does do your parks operate with? Um, right now, just that one million. Okay. Um, we've had cuts over the years. So uh, we, we rely heavily on our sports leagues. They donate a lot back to the fields and maintain them. We, we cut them, we mow them, but uh, we've turned over our concession stands to them, so they maintain them. We maintain the outside, but they've maintained the inside of them and done all the upgrades and purchased all the equipment for them, which has been a, it's been a benefit. Um, they've really stepped up and helped us out over the years. 
So you have a really good working relationship with those leagues. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, how many employees in your department? And are some in of them full, uh, some full time? We have in recreation, we have five full and 10 part time. Um, under our parks, which I, I don't oversee our parks division here in Tarpon, um, just over recreation, but we have another 15 in our parks division. Okay, all right. Um, all right, I, th I think that's I think that's it for me. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Okay, Alderman Walker. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Dolan, I appreciate you. Uh, uh, your interest in the city of Startville and in our, our position. Um, Startville's uh, parks have come a long way. We've uh, done, I think, are doing a, a nice job uh, of making sure that they're meeting the needs of, of all of our residents. And we're, we're certainly looking to, to try to keep that momentum that we've had going. Uh, pandemic uh, aside, we're, we're still making progress. Um, and I think we've done a, the boards over the, the last uh, several boards have, are doing a, a good job of trying to make sure that we're able to give resources, both in terms of people and money, to, to make those improvements. Um, having said that, could you talk just a little bit about management, uh, your management style, and how you would approach that in the city of Starville, knowing that currently, as our organizational chart uh, works at, uh, there would be one director and you're sort of in charge of everybody. So that's parks and recreation sort of combined. So how would you approach um, uh, leading uh, the, the staff and uh, the department in Um I'm big on being a team player, I guess. I, I like to lead by example, but um, I try to know a little bit about everything, I guess, without being an expert on it. Uh, and when it comes to my team now, I, I try to hire the best possible people so that I don't have to micromanage. I, I you know, I, I think we've all dealt with bosses like that. So I will step in when need to be, but I like to let my team do their job. Um, that's what they're hired for. And I, and I think if you have a strong leader up top showing them the direction that the whole city wants to go to or the department as a whole, that the true, true ones who want to be there will follow in line and they'll want to step up. And I, and I think by showing my passion for the job really has the, my team fall in. And I think just showing them being a motivator, um, giving them the skills necessary, supporting them when they need to be, but also being honest and open with them. And if they fail, not, like, not having them be afraid to fail so that they can come to me with questions. They can come um, if they have suggestions without being like, I'm going to shoot them right down right off the bat. So uh, it's worked very well for me here. Um, so that's the way I like to lead my team. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. My pleasure. Alderman Walker, is that it? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right, thank you. Alderman Beatty. Mr. Dolan, good morning. Good morning, sir. How does the Tarpon Springs derive its revenue for its parts of Red Bull? Where's, where's the revenue come from? Is it special tax or do you get an allocation from your, your city's general fund? Where, where does your budget revenue come We're, from? We are out of the general fund. Um, over the last five years, we um, all of our budget comes out of our general fund, but our re revenue return has been about 35% of our expenses, so we've returned. Um, our city is big on free programs for the youth specifically. Um, so take our youth leagues, we charge $2.50 an hour per field to use them, and that's it. Um, so our, our camps are very inexpensive. We do 10-week uh, camps normally at $50 a week. Um, so our, our, our goal from our board of direction is not to over, I guess, charge our re local residents. So our, you know, we have recreation cards in town. They're five dollars for anyone eighteen and over. It's free for any youth seventeen and under. Um, but anyone outside the city limits pay fifty-five dollars a year for a card, and that actually just gets them in the building. So, um, and then we rely heavily on our sponsorships. So for our beach concert series, uh, we wouldn't be able to put them on if we didn't have sponsors. So every year we're out searching for sponsors to cover the cost of that. Um, 
So the direction I have been given is, you know, cover your costs for your programs, uh, more specialized ones, they have to cover them all. When it comes to youth, we can do them for free sometimes. Uh, that's why we have the general fund and our taxes from property tax and um, money generated from us producing water and selling it back to the citizens. Thank you. Uh, one other question. You mentioned that uh, you've just been involved in swimming pool construction. Talk about Springs. Has this been a recent thing? Yes, sir. Um, in the last four years. Um, tell, tell me, how do you how do you view uh, swimming programs, municipal or city uh, sponsored city uh, swimming programs as an overall part of the uh, recreation uh, program for a city? I know in Mississippi we don't do that a lot, and none of our colleges up here, with the exception of one school over uh, Dell State, has a swimming collegiate swimming program, which I think we are not are underserving our youth and young, young people in our state when our colleges and stuff. But, and if you throw us all into the lake, we don't. We, most of us will swim. You know, we know how to swim, but there's just not. There's not a lot of organized swimming programs. Is that something that's big in Florida? Tell me and, and kind of your approach, your attitude towards uh, your philosophy on that. I am a swimmer by heart. Um, I swam through college, so um, I then I coached the high school swim team in town. Actually, so I did that for five years until recently, where I stopped so I can coach my children's baseball team. But um, I think swimming is, is huge, especially here in Florida. Um, we have five, in high school level, at least, we have five different divisions. So they break it down by the size of the school and they take it very serious. It's year round. Um, here in Tarpon, where we have half our town is water, um, we actually don't have a pool. I went through all the process and they found out that it was going to be too expensive. And the school board, we were partnering with the school board on it, and they stuff happened, funding dropped off, so they couldn't commit any more funds. The city <laughs> realized that the in-house work that they were gonna do was higher than initially expected. So we went through the whole process. I have all the plans for a lovely pool. We just and we did the groundbreaking, but we never ended up building it. So um, the pool was gonna be on school property, and we were gonna offer free swimming lessons to our low income area because our city manager is big into that. And I, and I believe it's, it's necessary here in Florida. Um, I think everyone should know how to swim. And I, and I think if we have the capability to do it and offer free lessons to our, to youth under the age of five, I think it should be mandatory if we could do it over five. I think it gets a little bit more specialized because you give them the basics by then. And hopefully by five children would know how to swim. I, I'm one of those people. I dropped my kid in the pool. I, eight months and said, hey, bob up and down. But that's what I was done when my parents did it to me, or they tell me they did it to me, so I did it to my children. Um, so yeah, I, I think swimming's huge. Um, more more water, more chance of drowning. So here in Florida, we're definitely uh, high on that, but we still have a high drowning here in Florida. Parents don't lock their pools, so it, it's a serious issue. Um, Thank you for your comments on that. You're welcome. Anything else? That's, that's all for me. Okay. Alderman Vaughn. Mr. Dolan, thank you for applying for this position. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. How are you? I'm doing great. I got three things I'm asking. First of all, can you and will you be able to discipline and reward employees regardless of what field of management they have, race, sex, gender, creed? Can you be fair to all employees? Yes, sir. Uh, we have many different parts, right? Do you think you'll be able to check on them, evaluate them on a consistent basis to keep us informed that when we need to be doing something on our fields and our park? I, I do believe so. I, I think getting out into the community and making sure that your team is doing what they're expected and just, you know, it's always good to have a nice set of eyes, another pair of eyes on a, on a field and a complex. So I um, truly believe I could do that. Two reasons why you want to locate here and start me in this position. Um, career advancement, to be honest. It, it's an opportunity to run my own Parks and Rec department. Um, and family from there. We have land up in Tula, outside of Oxford. So um, my, you know, my wife is, there's only a few places my wife would move. <laughs> um, Mississippi is one of them. Um, 
probably the only place outside the state of Florida she would move to, as she's told me. So having family in the state is, you know, and land up there is uh, another reason why. And we, we like the area. I, I really, and we like small towns. Um, and Tampa and Pinellas County, where we live, is uh, it's overpopulated. We got a lot of people here. So uh, to get out of the rat race is always a nice thing to do. Last question. Do you have any track program with your, with your uh, sporting? We did. Um, when I lost my last programmer, um, it kind of slowed down. And the, the one who came in after didn't pick it up because it was in between seasons. And it just, uh, we did a countywide here um, through the, all the different rec departments in the county. So inside the actual city limits, we didn't have our own. We had an adult one for a long time until our track got it's a concrete track and the people stopped wanting to run on concrete. So we didn't have a nice rubberized track at the high school where we were using. So they just, they ended up stopped using it. Thank you, Mr. Dolan. God bless you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank You're you welcome. all. Thank you. I want to circle back, Mr. Dolan, for a couple of questions I wanted to ask. Have you had uh, experience with getting grants? And, and I'm thinking about one of the things that we've been benefited by is getting some grants in the community to do an overlay of a walking track, for example. And we've got a 10-minute walk uh, grant uh, through NRPA, I guess it is. So I'm assuming you have an affiliation or you're very aware of the National Park and Rec Association? Yes, ma'am. I'm certified park and rec professional. Um, I also attended the NRPA's director school. So I'm a graduate of that. That was a two-year program. And they went into, um, that's heavily on becoming a certified organization uh, through NRPA. Uh, so they do, they go over grant writing. We've gotten a few grants in here. Uh, Musco Lighting is a big one for lights. They're, they're helpful with getting grants. We got one through the NFL Play 60. Um, we're looking at one right now to build pickleball courts in town through the LWCF down here. So um, we we are heavily involved in writing grants because our funding is not always there. Okay. Um, we have just uh, converted a tennis court to pickleball courts, and that seems to be a, a rising popular sport. So yes, ma'am. Until, until our most recent manager, um, who, who has since moved to Musco, um, I had never even heard of pickleball. So there you have it. Um, and in terms of marketing, you have done marketing for your park department, for your recreation department? Yes, ma'am. I, uh, I guess I brainstorm. I have a gentleman who does all our digital marketing. I, I spit out a lot of ideas and then he, he creates them. So... He, he's the technician, I guess, the mastermind behind it. Just we, we like to bounce things off. Um, in my previous job, I had the pleasure of doing our annual or monthly newsletter. So I had to create our monthly newsletter every month. So four signature one, 16 pages, uh, doing the artwork for it, working with the printer, making sure everything was laid out correctly. So and most currently, it's just coming up with our you know different marketing schemes, how we're going to do our posters, how we're going to do our advertisement on social media. Um, from not just doing still photos to doing actual videos and getting our word out that way. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, anything you'd like to tell us before we let you go? Um, I had a pleasure meeting with you all. Um, my I, the big thing is graduating of the NRPA director school. That, that gave me a great knowledge. Um, I've grown a lot working from a large city as just a supervisor is now being overseeing our own recreation division here in um, town. Uh, it'd be a great opportunity. I would love the opportunity to come to Starkville, um, like I said earlier. And uh, thank you very much for your time today. It was a pleasure speaking with you all. Okay. Well, we appreciate you being with us and uh, hope that you have a great weekend. Thank you so much. You, you as well. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bye. Mr. Bill. All right, Matt, do we have um, Mr. Peters up? Well, I see Jason's up. <laughs> we need to interview need Mr. Peters. <laughs> yeah, let's interview Jason for this position. <laughs> I'm sorry, he's in? He's logging in. Okay, he's logging in. Okay, great.
There we go. Mr. Peters? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for thank you for being with us. We appreciate it. We've got um, four aldermen here at the table, and we have one that is also zooming in. So um, we'll get started here. Um, we have been just chatting a little bit. Um, we are delighted to have you uh, interview with us, and we appreciate you taking the time on this Friday morning. Would you like to give us a bit of an opening statement? Sure. Well, first off, Mayor, I would like to say thank you because um, I see that you were in the Navy and you were the first female um, pilot on a carrier. So oh, I appreciate that. I've been researched. Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm in the Air Force Reserve, so, you know, it, it's just a pleasure to meet another fellow military member. <clears throat> but... Um, Quick, just quick, uh, my name's Thomas Monroe Peters. You know, um, I'm currently the interim director here at Claflin University. I've uh, been here since November. Uh, so I come in to pretty much um, get the facility up and running. Um, I've been in recreation pretty much my entire career. I was 12 years old when I first started coaching and working in recreation. And um, I enjoyed it. And <clears throat> sports is my top priority. I love sports. I love putting on tournaments. I love uh, interacting with not just the youth, but also with our adults. And so um, that's what makes me happy um, as well. And, you know, I think um, the, the, the position um, was, it kind of caught my attention, especially being closer to home. I'm from Louisiana originally, uh, but I'm also an associate pastor at a church in Jackson, Mississippi. And so it helped to really draw me closer um, to home as well as I see y'all get ready to build a new brand new facility. And so I would love to be a part of that, um, considering that's kind of one of my specialties is facility sports and tournaments. OK, well, we we appreciate your um, relationship with Mississippi. So um, I'm going to start off and then I'll let each alderman uh, ask questions that, that they um, would like to ask of you. So um, from the perspective of uh, this position, you do you have you do have some construction experience. Did I hear that accurately? Yes, ma'am. Um, you know, we built a brand new sports facility when I was uh, the athletic director in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Uh, we built a full field um, baseball complex out there and we redid our um, tennis complex, uh, which I was the project manager over that. Uh, people tend to think I'm a little tough when it comes to with facilities, but you have to be tough in order to get the project and the outcome that you want. Okay. Um, and what's the population of your current city? What's the population of? Well, actually, you're not you're not there. It's it was it was uh, Pine Bluff. What was what was Pine Bluff's size when you were Pine, there? Pine Bluff had a little over one hundred and fifty thousand people. Yeah. Um, 86, 86 percent um, African Americans um, and ten percent um, Caucasians, and of course four percent of other races. Okay. All right. Um, and you were, you were there for four years, three years, four years? The, almost four years. Four years. Okay. Um, I've lost my, lost. My, oh, um, did, have you done any marketing? Have you done any of that kind of thing of sports programs and that sort of thing? Yeah. And that's, uh, that's pretty much what you have to do in order to number one, draw teams in. Um, that was one of the biggest hurdles for me when I got to Pine Bluff. Um, because it is such a small market in the area, especially when you have two colleges. Um, you had UAPB, plus you had a community college there, so you're competing with them to, you know, get sponsorships. Um, but the city did, you know, the city helped out quite a bit as far as um, the financial side and as far as trying to help us to get the memberships um, or the sponsorships that we needed for our facilities. And, you know, I'm real good at talking with people and getting money out of people. Uh, <laughs> let them, you know, my thing is the worst thing anybody can ever tell you is no. So you, you, unless you try, the only answer they can tell you is no, then you just move on to the next person. 
Okay. Well, I know that you know the entire world is having budget difficulties, and as as are we. And and I'm sure you, since you're at a university there, um, there'll be constraints that you're going to have to work with. And we are in exactly the same position. So um, belt tightening is going to be one of those things that we're going to require as we move forward over the next year or two. So um, have you managed, have you gone through that process with any of your facilities that you've been at or any of your uh, organizations you've been in? Well, at Palm Bluff, um, I pretty much as far as athletics, when I got there, didn't have a budget. So um, I had to kind of go around in different departments, uh, especially our economic department. Um, uh, department they had quite a bit of money so they was able to get money for me to help build up the programs and the facilities to where we needed them in order to bring in tournaments um, at the <clears throat> capacity that I thought was generating for the city of Palm Bluff and so as far as not having money or being lack of money as far as um, for my programming it's I'm used to it. So during this time, you know, it's no different than what I've been through before. You know, we just have to watch what we spend. If we don't need it, don't buy it. Um, and then what, as much as we can do in-house, we do in-house. Because I'm one of those to where, um, even though I'm the director, I don't mind getting out there cutting grass to help out our facility guys and, you know, to kind of cut back and help them out as well, even if it's going to help cut back on costs. Okay, I've got just two more quick questions. And one, have you have you done much in the way of getting grants? Yes, um, I haven't personally written them. I'm actually trying to take a class now uh, to learn how to write grants. But I know my previous places, uh, we've always had somebody in house that wrote grants for us. Similar um, to now, uh, we do have a Title Three grant writer here, uh, so I'm working closely with her because um, we're working. On grant now uh, to try and foster more towards our youth program. And even though our Parks and Rec in the city does a lot, but we're trying to foster to um, areas that help student kids more so in different sports. Okay. And then last question, NRPA, are you, are you a member of NRPA? Uh, National, National Parks and, Rec Parks and Recreation? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Okay. All right. Cool. Well, uh, what we'll do is I will go um, around the room and uh, Alderman Sistrunk is in Ward 2 and she actually is the one who's got the most parks. So, uh, but she's our budget chair, as she said. So we'll let her ask her budgetary questions or whatever. <laughs> um, and, and because you're at a university now, um, you can answer these based on prior municipal experience um, and as opposed to where you are right now if you want to. But I'm curious to know what size budgets you have managed in the past, how much, um, what, what the departmental budget was, uh, Pine Bluff or some other place. Well, um, Pine Bluff, we started out um, at $1.3 um, million. And then, of course, over the years, it has gone down. Um, this past year, um, in 2019, our budget had gotten all the way down to $729,000. And as you know, that is kind of tough to run a whole parks and recreation facility on that little money, but we do manage to get it done. That was, that's interesting. We, we seem to be bucking a trend here in Startville in that we're investing more in our parks these days than, um, than we had in the past. Uh, although we went through a period where we didn't invest as much as we probably should have in our parks. What about staff sizes? Um, the largest group you've supervised? The largest group I've supervised um, was... Full-time, seasonal, you, you can break it down if you need to. Uh, was a total um, of 53. Um, and those were mainly part-timers and Six of those were full-timers. Okay. Um, I'm going to borrow one of Alderman Beatty's um, questions. The money at, at Pine Bluff, uh, I'm guessing, came from the general fund, um, plus whatever revenues you guys were able to generate yourself? Yes, ma'am. Uh, came from general funds, Then we had our rentals and our tournaments brought in a good bulk of Okay. Okay. Um, I think that's it for me. Thank, thank you. Thank you.
Mr. Peters, thank you for interviewing with us. I had a quick question looking at your resume. So you're in the interim director now in Orangeburg, is that correct? Yes, sir. What prompted you to relocate from South to, to South Carolina from uh, Arkansas on an interim basis? Well, um, the new president now currently, Dr. Warmack, um, him and I knew each other from our days at Western Carolina before he became, you know, doctor. And so he actually picked up the phone when he got this position in August and asked me if I was willing to, you know, get back in higher education and that they had a brand new facility here. Um, they, they did the ribbon cutting back in January of 2019 and it had not been open because they didn't have a director in place. And he wanted me to come in and get it kick started, get everything up and going, all the policies, the procedures, all the, like now I'm waiting on, um, we're getting a shipment of new equipment coming in this morning, which I thought would have been here now. So, you know, to make that move, I wanted to be a, uh, become a director. And since I kind of got overlooked at Pine Bluff, um, it was time for, you know, with all the years of experience, I've always wanted to be a director and to prove to everyone that uh, what I can bring to the table and the turnaround that I can do for uh, Parks and Rec Department, whether it's on the city level or whether it's at the university level. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Alderman Walker. First of all, uh, Mr. Peters, thank you for your service. Um, question I have, uh, Alderman Sistrong asked a, a little bit in terms of your the number of people that you've managed um, could you talk a little bit about your management style and how you approach, uh, how would you approach uh, managing and operating the, uh, the city of Starkville's Parks and Recreation Department? Well, first off, I will basically come in, spend some time seeing how, the, how everything is run. Um, I won't come in and make any immediate changes um, unless there was something that needed to be changed at that moment. But... Uh, my management style is I trust my employees to do their job. Um, I don't like to micromanage. Um, I, you know, I trust them. If I give them a timeline, I expect the timeline to be done. I do, you know, follow up with them to make sure that they, they do stay on track. We do have weekly meetings, staff meetings, to make sure that we're all on the same page. We all know what's going on. Um, so I can get their feedback. So when I do have to sit down with the mayor or sit down with the aldermans or city council meeting, that um, I'm abreast of what's going on. So I trust my employees. I've never, I've only had to fire three employees in my whole um, entire career. And that's the hardest thing to ever have to do. But um, I'm one of those, I'm laid back. I trust them to get their job done. As long as you trust them, they'll do a good job. Alderman Walker, anything else? Uh, no, ma'am. I think that's it. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Alderman Beatty. Oh, Mr. Peters, good morning. Good morning sir. How do you do swimming and swimming programs in the city parks and recreation department as, as, as part of, or do you uh, – on, on swimming as a part of the overall comprehensive, I guess, recreation uh, uh, opportunities for uh, for young people in the city. And I, and I preface this with, with another candidate by saying that, that I think in Mississippi we don't do that as much. We don't have collegiate swimming programs here, like in Arkansas, Louisiana, LSU has got a swim program, Arkansas got a swim program. You know, I, I think all the SEC schools, with session of two, maybe, Old Miss and State have swimming programs and it's just uh, it's something I think it's lacking I, I, as, as we progress as a city and grow and things I'd like to see us you know implement more of this kind of thing but I know it's one of your uh, one of your references is a, um, a gentleman who was a former swim coach at Limestone College so I, I assumed you had, had familiar with had some background in that but I just wanted your thoughts on that well um, you know that's a good question because in Palm Bluff, um, I guess 30 years ago, they had a swimming uh, facility. Then it got, you know, it got buried. It got covered up, which is now where our current uh, ball fields currently sit now. And just last July, we just opened up a new um, 
aquatic center in Palm Bluff. And, you know, has the kitty, the kitty side as well as the regular swimming pool side with the diving boards. To me, swimming is the most important thing that I think we need to teach our kids. And I enjoyed what, when I was at Cornell, Cornell implemented that every student that came through Cornell in order to graduate, you had to learn how to swim. So you basically had four years to learn how to swim. Um, and so that's something that we really need to teach our young kids. You got so many kids that's afraid of swimming, that's afraid of the water um, and not learning how to swim. Um, I think it's, um, it's not good for our community. It's not good for our kids. And we really, really need to start at a very, very young age. Um, so I would definitely bring in the knowledge and as far as bringing in the people that's qualified to teach those classes and get our kids started at a very young age. Thank you. I know that uh, uh, I know some older people who graduated from Auburn University, and that was at one time, it may not be now, but it was a prerequisite for graduation at Auburn. You had to take a swimming class to watch swim to graduate from Auburn. So uh, it, it's, it's important to me, and I like to see Mississippi and Starville as time goes on prog progress and put more emphasis on that. But thank you for your comments on that. Yeah, and as well, if I can continue, you know, as well as, you know, once we built that facility in Palm Bluff, we did start bringing in teams for swim meets. And, you know, as long as you have the, the proper um, clocking system, you know, it, it, it won't be that hard to bring in swimming teams into Starkville, especially if it's an area that they've never been to before. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Alderman Bowman. Mr. how you doing, sir? Good morning, sir. So thank you so much. Thank you for applying. I got four questions. I asked the last candidate. I'm actually to, can you and will you be able to discipline and reward an employee regardless of what field of management, race, sex, gender, creed, and can you be fair to all employees? One thing anybody and everyone that I've ever worked for or worked under would tell you I'm probably the most um, straightforward an honest person and I treat everybody the same, you know, and that's my biggest pet peeve is seeing people treated differently. Um, yes, everybody, we kept the record of when you come into my office, we do a sit down. If I got to, we got to do a sit down. I keep track of it. Um, and everyone, no matter who you are, everyone's going to get treated the same, whether you're a supervisor or whether you're a seasonal employee. Thank you. Number two, we have many parks here in Stoneville. Will you be able to check and evaluate on a consistent basis? Yes, sir. That's one thing that I definitely want to make sure that the board and the mayor stays um, abreast on is, and probably you might see me more than what you want to see me. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and I'm one of those where I like to, you know, whether we go sit down, have, I don't drink coffee. And if you do, I drink water. So uh, whether we sit down, have a cup of coffee, a glass of water, and just have a conversation and just let you know what, what's going on. Because I, I want to stay in your good graces because I might need some money. <laughs> <laughs> what are two reasons why you want to get this position here at Shawnville? I'm sorry, say that again? What are two reasons why you want this position here at Shawnville? Well, number one, location. Uh, you know, it's, it's five hours from my home which is close enough. It's not too far to where they can pop in and see me every day. Uh, but it's just far enough to where I can, you know, make a trip down there and turn around and come back, you know, and being that close to Mississippi state, I got a little cousin uh, who's going to spend her first year at um, Southern Miss this year uh, before she transfer over to Mississippi state. So it'd be nice to have, so she can have family close to her. And I have a couple of church members that actually are members at, uh, I mean, students at Mississippi State currently right now. And plus, I referee in the SEC so, uh, for volleyball. So being able to be drive just a couple of minutes up the road would be perfect for me. The last one, what about uh, AEU track program? You ever deal with those? I, I have worked with them, the, the Monroe Association. Um, so to me, Track and field, I'm, I'm a track person. I ran track, I ran cross country. I played all the sports in high school, um, except baseball. Um, made the team, but I chose not to play because of track. 
And so I love it. I have two of my um, stepkids are on the Monroe track team right now. And a bunch of my friends actually coach team. And so that's something that I really wanted to kind of get back into. Um, and that was something that I was thinking about maybe starting here because Orangeburg doesn't have a track program. We don't have one either. Thank you so much, Mr. Peters. God bless. Thank you, Mr. Peters. Is there anything that you would like to add to what we've talked about or anything we didn't cover that you'd like to share with us? No, just a few things that, um, you know, looking, looking at the website, um, some things that I would love to change when I get there is, especially on the rentals and the facilities, you know, in order for people to see what we have to offer, they need to be able to see pictures. Uh, so not having pictures of the what the facilities look like exactly. Um, I know you're getting ready to build a, a new um, complex out there. And, you know, having those fields where people can go on our website, they can see what the facilities look like. Um, you meet you need to be able to sh showcase and show people exactly what you have and what you have to offer. Um, and, you know, bringing in new programs. I'm, I've worked with, um, I'm not sure if you've seen on my resume, I work with Major League Baseball with the pitch hit and run program. I've done that for the last seven years with them. Um, and I've been privileged enough for the last three years to be able to host sectionals and regionals um, on those, as well as with the junior NBA basketball skills competition. Um, and all those, all those sports are free. And it amazes me when I go to different places that people don't, has never heard of that. Nobody in the state of Arkansas, in the state of South Carolina has never had the pitch hit and run program before or never had the, uh, the junior NBA skills competition. And I tell people that is free for students. All they got to do is just come out and participate. They pay no money. Um, it's free for them. And if they make it to the next round, if they're ever able to make it to nationals, that's a paid trip um, for those kids. For the junior NBA, it's paid for them and for the kid and one of their parents to go to the NBA All-Stars and they compete in front of the NBA All-Stars. For the Major League Pitch Hit and Run, you know, those kids get to go to the All-Star game and compete in those different skills in front of their favorite athletes. So it amazes me that so many parks and rec programs don't um, reach out and partner with our with these different major league programs. Um, okay. So. Anything else? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, ma'am, you good. That's it? Okay. All right, that sounds, sounds great. Um, I appreciate your service. I did not mention that, but I thank you for your service as well. I see the Air Force Reserve and you are continuing in that. Is that, is that one weekend a month or is that, how, is they, how do they do that? Uh, it's just one weekend a month um, right, right now. You know, we're doing everything through telephone, so we're not meeting in person right now. So it's basically one weekend a month, two weeks out the year. Yeah, okay. It's like most most programs, most, most military programs. Okay, well, thank you so much. If there's nothing else, then we greatly appreciate you taking your Friday morning and, and spending time with us and, and that you're interested in our position. So thank you so much, and, and uh, you have a great weekend. Thank you. Yeah, have a blessed day as well. All right. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. All right, we have a full work session to include. Um, Ms. Kemp, there we are. Uh, we're going to start with Leah. You're up first. So um, I'm going to let me run a quick introduction because one of the things that we have uh, kind of felt was was going on around the country with our restaurants are obviously in some distress because of COVID-19. And so they have been struggling with ways to uh, expand their offerings, uh, you know, curbside and to go and drive through and all that sort of thing is things they've been able to do. They now can do 50% in their inside, but to have some expanded seating opportunities, some cities um, have created street opportunities for restaurants so that they can expand the eating opportunities um, in the, in actually in the streets. And, and I thought that was a extremely cool idea that was worth exploring. And so uh, David, Mr. Alderman Little sits on the Main Street Board and we talked about that as something to do because y'all will recall that parking is always a big issue with people uh, in the downtown area. But in this case, um, taking up some parking spaces is something that they thought would be beneficial to 
uh, the downtown merchants, not only the street, the, the restaurant merchants, but also those who have shops there that is kind of create an atmosphere that would bring people back downtown. And so um, the Carl Small Town Center has graciously said that they would help us with this and has done a design. And uh, in talking to Main Street, what we have, we have planters that are left over from our tactical urbanism from uh, a couple of years ago, where we tried to see how turning radius and areas of pedestrian walk uh, in both Ward 5 and Ward uh, 2 were, were impacted. So we have some, some uh, planters that are being used or as a part of the potential for this. And so um, with that in mind, Ms. Kemp, you have a PowerPoint I do. for us? Okay. Um, thanks for having me here today. Absolutely. Thank you for volunteering. I, I think, think I know most everybody here. So hello again. And for those of you that I don't know, um, I'm Leah Kemp. I'm the director of the Small Town Center. We are a design, uh, community design center within the School of Architecture. And we provide design and training services for communities of lots of different sizes all over the state. So um, streetery, uh, we're talking about a streetery here, and it's really just a catchy term for an on-street cafe. And like the mayor said, this would be a temporary option. A lot of cities try these out as a temporary option, and then later they decide to make it more permanent. But in this case, we're really thinking about temporary options for social distancing, providing extra seating for the local restaurants. This would be a shared space for multiple restaurants and for the community. So it would be amenity um, for the community, the downtown area. Um, the other option, uh, the other um, idea behind this concept is that it would be quickly assembled, low cost, and hopefully attractive. So this is the area that we're looking at in between, um, it would stretch from restaurant Tyler um, down to about the middle of Moe's. And this is kind of the basic plan here where um, you have some sort of perimeter wall and some seating um, within that with shade structures, perhaps lighting. It would be access from the sidewalk, not the street. I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail um, in the plan. You can see the plan down below and an enlarged plan above. This would be about 115 feet wide by 14 feet deep. It would not um, encompass the full depth of an existing parking space so that there would be a little bit of a buffer between the barrier and the um, street, street traffic. So the perimeter could be made up of a number of different barriers and we'll talk about that in a minute. But again, it would be accessed from the sidewalk only. And we've shown four different ramps along um, the sidewalk here. Streeteries can have a couple of different options where you provide decking to be raised up to the sidewalk level. And while those are great, um, we looked into that and it's pretty cost prohibitive at this point. Um, so we thought that the four inch distance between the sidewalk and the on street level would be easily accommodated by a series of ramps. So that would um, tackle the ADA issues there. Looking at the plan down below, um, we preserve the first parking spot here for um, handicap um, accessibility, which is already in existence. And the adjacent spot would be curbside pickup. Um, there are additional opportunities for curbside pickup on the east side of the streetery. And looking at the perimeter walls, the barriers, we looked at a number of different things. Um, there are some products that you can purchase online and they're really beautiful. They're prefabricated kind of fences, um, but they're pretty expensive. And so we looked at some options that could be quickly constructed, fabricated um, probably in a day or so, and um, easily deconstructed at a later date. Some of these options we looked at would be kind of a wood slot barrier in combination with the planters that the mayor mentioned. So we would alternate um, the fabricated barrier and the existing planters along the perimeter. And this option you can see would be a little over $3,000. We looked at a wood and metal option that would also be easily um, and quickly fabricated. That's around $2,000. And then we arrived at a final concept um, that I want to show you, which is a cinder block option. And so placing the cinder blocks for uh, high, it would be about 32 inches high, and then 
um, spacing those with the planters, alternating those with the planters on both the sidewalk side of the street and the um, traffic side of the street. And that provides a couple of different options for us. So not only does it provide secure um, perimeter for the whole area, but it also allows us to add some additional structures here to potentially hang some solar panel, um, solar powered string lights. Um, one of the options here that we looked at for the center block is obviously we could paint the whole wall. That might take a lot of time. But we're looking at a couple of different options where you could just paint a few pieces in a different pattern so that you can provide some visual um, amenity to the area, but also provide a very quick way to fabricate this and make it look attractive. I'm going to show you, um, I don't know if there's a way to play the animation, just to kind of give you an overview of um, what the whole thing looks like. So we're going to just press play on there. Yep. So there's your handicap spot and curbside pickup, some potential signage to indicate what this is. The tables and chairs um, have been agreed by Restaurant Tyler and Moe's owners to be provided by them. As have the umbrellas, or at least that was the last word I got, because essentially during the summer months, if we don't have umbrellas, this is <laughs> right. And they were no provided. Point. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's an area that desperately needs it. So you've got kind of festoon lighting coming from the each end of that and across the way there. Is that, right. is that what I'm seeing? That's right. So they would kind of be in sections yeah. where the center block walls exist. So Mr. Kemp? Senior, do we have the ability to, is there some electric opportunities there? I'm sorry. <laughs> Your daughter-in-law just threw you in the <laughs> threw you under well, the bus. You mentioned solar. <laughs> we looked at solar and electrical. This scheme shows solar because right now there's no real way to hook up um, any sort of electrical. Okay, well that answers um, well, the question. Unless you attach it to the building. Okay. So it would just look a little bit different. Okay. But right now, there's no access for okay. electrical right now. That's why we proposed a solar. And there, I think it goes back to that thing. We've got circuits. Yeah. Uh, and we've got to, we've looked at opportunities to redo that. That would be a significant change in the side, but it's the Okay. All right. Uh, we advance to the next slide. This is what everybody's concerned about, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the budget. So on the left-hand column, I've shown the items that would need to be procured, and on the right-hand column, these are um, elements that would be provided in kind. And so with the cinder block option, we're looking at around $1,000 um, or less, depending on um, what sort of paint you get and how much you paint. Um, for the block fill, um, providing some stability for the blocks. Um, we priced out sand and pea gravel. Now, this might be something that perhaps the city could provide in kind. I don't want to step out of turn by suggesting that, but some of these options that we'll go through could be procured otherwise by the city um, and, and could be eliminated from the lineup. In, light, in terms of lighting, we've shown electrical, about $2,300, um, and then solar panel option would be, or solar powered option, would be about $1,700. Um, those are things that you don't have to have. They're completely optional. Um, it would dress it up a little bit, make it more inviting. But, you know, and then again, we could even look at kind of spacing them out and eliminating some of them and reducing that cost. But as we showed it here, that's about what the price would be. The ground covering, we spec out AstroTurf, which is about 12 foot uh, wide. And that would be about $500. Again, this is completely optional, not necessary. We think it would dress it up and also hopefully provide a little cooling effect for the area. Um, another thing I'll say about these um, items here, they're all readily available locally, except for the solar paneled powered um, lighting. The ramps could be, I would assume, um, procured by the city. That might, you know, I think that would be an easy constructible item. 
and then signage, depending on whether that could be procured um, internally or not, would be about 250. So with all of these line items, it would be about $4,000. Um, but again, thinking, hoping that maybe some of that could be um, managed a little bit. Okay, all right. Any any questions of Ms. Kemp? All of them drunk. Um, temporary, mm -hmm. potentially be could become permanent, but, but if it does not become permanent, there's no damage to the street. That's right. Um, from my conversations with a couple of restaurant people, they would um, work with making sure that there's no issues with trash or um, that sort of thing that they would they would monitor and, and pick up each day. Um, the 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 big con would be the loss of those parking places for a short period of time mm -hmm. at a time when we're not really don't have as much demand for parking places as, as we have had in the past. The, the budget, um, I'm, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say that if our sales tax numbers are as good as I'm going to do a think they are. Yeah, we'll, I, we'll, I, I, well, that was what we'll I was thinking. If we have to, we can do a GoFundMe. But if the sales tax numbers are as good as we think they may be, that's a, that's a minor cost that we should be able to, to accommodate okay. or GoFundMe. Now, I'm going for the GoFundMe as pain. Okay. Community activity. There okay. you go. There you go. Uh, on the little. No, thank you. Yeah, and and he, uh, you're you're the Main Street board, so you can you can back me up when I say yes. that the Main Street board was very positive I, about this. I think this. anything we can do to, as a board yeah. to help facilitate yeah. more tables, more potential diners, more turning of tables while they're at the at reduced capacity, um, certainly could help impact our sales tax revenues, right. and we definitely need some help in those areas right now. So it's a, it's a minor minor investment. Yes, for, for, for minor, the, very minor. For, and. And our sales tax hits have been higher in the restaurant areas than in other other segments of our market. And maybe some of those that are fearful of getting out inside, we can let them come yep. sit outside in fresh air. So, right. well, right, and it's a shared space, so it can be used in a number of different ways down the line if you want to. So. Okay. All right. Thank you, okay. Alderman Walker. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you. First of all, Leah, I think this is really nice, nice uh, presentation, and I'm 100% on board with uh, this as an idea. I, I do have a little bit of concern with the cinder block as an option. Um, really has nothing more to do with, uh, you know, looking at the sand, holding it in. And I think that would, I think that would be a fine option. Um, but I am a little bit of con concerned about how, uh, say, stormwater is going to move across and hit that and have it be a barrier prior to it getting to the curb. And so while I don't think there is a need to necessarily go back to the drawing board, I do have one thing that might be at least worth uh, kicking around conceptually. Um, we, we use wheel stops quite a bit in scenarios that already have holes drilled in to be able to pin them down that would essentially get, uh, allow water to, to sort of move through. It, it, I'd be curious if uh, it would be worth just taking a look um, if where you're showing the center blocks, if you might be able to get, say, a couple wheel stops and pin them down and what comes up could still be the steel tubing. And then you do something like a cattle panel barrier that's in between that could easily be moved in and out and probably would be uh, less expensive and honestly might be more aesthetic uh, when it's all said and done. But I'm 100 percent on board with the with the idea, um, and if that's if the center blocks is what moves to to move forward, while that is temporary, that that's a lot of that's a lot of effort um, and a lot of materials that uh, will stops with metal coming up attached to some fire panels stretching across um, might might be able to get you there and uh, not have to worry about how the storm water is going to be redirected to before it gets to the curb and the, and the inlets there. But 100% on board. I think this is a good idea. I think it certainly will help the, the, the uh, restaurant tiers on Main Street. And I would say that while I'm on board with it here, I think if there's other places in town where we have restaurants that have on-street parking, I, I would certainly be willing to open up and look at all those options for them if they're willing to to put some skin in the game for that. And if it makes sense to do it there for us to be able to look at that option anywhere where this might be available. So nice job. I'm hundred percent on board. Um, might be worth taking uh, one more conceptual look at another option. That's not cinder. cinder board. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you
<laughs> sure, we can look at that. That's not a problem. Okay, thank you, thank you, Jason. Um, and from from that, are you? I was trying to because when we first started talking about this, I was trying to think around town where there was other there were other restaurants that actually did not have patios. And I was I couldn't come up with any because I was going to go there too <laughs> and try to feel them out. Jason, is there anything <coughs> in particular that you're thinking about in that relationship? Well, I, would, I would say I think the, the benefit of this is what we're ultimately trying to do is just increase seating capacity at a time when everything has already been been down. Um, and even if there is places that already have outdoor dining, if there's an opportunity to expand their dining uh, outdoors that they're losing, uh, for social distancing, both inside or out, I think that might be be an option. Um, and I, I would just say, I think a logical place, again, whether if they're willing to give up the parking spaces are the three parking spaces in front of the purple building in the Cotton District. It's nice and flat. Um, it would be a, a shared space for eating. Um, but again, if you're willing to, to give up three parking spaces there, and I don't know if the, the restaurant owners or others in the area are willing to do that, um, but you could get you could get a lot of table you can get a lot more tables with people than you can three cars in those three spots. Sure. Yeah. Okay. As I said, I had thought about it, but just couldn't come up with with anybody and hadn't heard anybody talk about it. So I appreciate your your sharing that with me. So okay, thank you, uh, Alderman Beatty. Thank you, Ms. Kim. Yes. Glad to have you with us. Thank you. <laughs> um, let's talk about the uh, the concept of moving here. In this place because if this if we pass this, this we would put this stuff in pretty quick, right? I would it's certainly hope so. That's the goal. And it's it's gonna get hot if you had any it's going to pay where's this gonna be on top of the page. And it stays hot from October, end of October, and we, we have some freaking weather, but it generally stays hot on it's about the first oh, until the first of November. How do we move? I mean, if we put up center blocks and they're how, how tall is 32 inches. 32 inches. So when you're sitting, you can still see above them. So the air would still kind of flow above them as you're eating. How, how could, have you thought about how, I mean, because we don't have wiring out there. I don't know how you put fans, sitting fans. You've got maybe um, umbrellas or something, not umbrellas, but the thing, any way to have fans or anything that moves air that would air circulate through there. Um, uh, Jason Walker said something while ago about cattle panels. I mean, I, I know they're not don't look great, but I mean, they're open. Right, they are. And you can also, there's some mesh products that you can actually dress them up with. Those, those panels run about $160 a pop and it, from what I've seen. And how many of them in there were, what, 50, 12, 15? Or seven feet long, something like that. Yeah, they're bringing uh, up time. I'm thinking about a different, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm thinking okay. a different cattle panel. I'm thinking the cattle panels that come in 16 foot sections that are about $30 a pound. You talking about the big ones, kind of pipe, kind of, right? Those, that type? No, I'm not. I'm talking about your your typical fence panel. That's about $30 at the co-op or a uh, uh, farm that could be cut into eight foot links or whatever you want and then uh, attached to, to metal. Um, but not not the big tubular kind, but but any of those would be options. But I was definitely thinking about the the more economical option to still provide a barrier. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, no. Oh, just thoughts about how we could, we could possibly, you know, have air improvement. I mean, sometimes it'll be some brief, sometimes it's going to be blown down. This is going to be summertime hot and on top of pavement. And, and at 7 in the evening, it's still going to be hot. And, 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 you know, pavement is still... What can we do? What do you think? I know you thought. Um, well, you know, if you're looking at the center block option, you can obviously rotate some of these around to provide some air movement through them. Um, it's one option, or, or looking at Alderman Walker's suggestion as a, as a different option. It's usually a panel of some type. Of, and that panel would go all the way, instead of center block, and Lewis, center block would go all the way down or something. Or just, well, I, I haven't looked specifically at what he's talking about. I'll go back and look at that. But we can definitely revise this scheme to make sure there is more airflow. We're looking at with battery powered options for fans or something like that. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Alderman Bond? No, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. okay. Um, you were, were you looking at the 32 inches, 36 inches, where it was you said? Oh, was that all the way around? Okay. And, and why did you do that sidewalk side? Well, primarily because um, we're going to be able to um, do the lights or the, the lighting. Okay. Without so, if you eliminate that um, side, 
you know, you would obviously eliminate the lighting, but well, I mean, you could do lighting around the outer edge to the sides, but right. you just wouldn't have it going right. all the way across. That's right. Okay, I just was mm -hmm. was just thinking because I had not, option. yeah, I had not thought about it sidewalk well, side. Another another thing so. we were looking at in terms of ADA accessibility, it kind of gives you a confined area to access the ramp. So um, you know, it's not necessary, but okay, okay. Just, I was just trying to get the sure. thought that went with that one. So, okay, thank you. Any other questions of Ms. Kemp? All right, thank you so much for doing that. I appreciate it. And we will move to the other member of the family, Mr. Kemp, <laughs> who is going to give us a, an update on the linkages project. So. I guarantee my presentation won't be nearly as colorful and have videos and things like that. But, um, Engineers. Right, engineers. I, I am joined today. She does do a better job. I'm engineer. I'm sorry. She does do a better job. Thank you. Uh, former Alderman Dumas is here um, representing Mississippi State. Uh, and as y'all know, this has been a this is a collaborative project uh, between the city, the Octobal County, and the university. And um, this project runs kind of through two different boundaries, one being in the city on MDOT right away, and then it extends on the MSU's campus. So. I thought it would be helpful uh, to have Mr. Dumas here, just in case y'all had some questions about the university's perspective on it. We have been meeting together really for the last year or so on this from the initial concept. And um, we, we present to y'all today the, the final plan, the pretty much finished plan, still waiting on MDOT's final approval of everything, but they have been with us all the way through. Uh, MDOT is, is on board with the Federal Highway, uh, it's taken a long time to get here, but I wanted to kind of give you an update on where we are and kind of where we're going from here. Um, I want to talk really briefly about the, the typical sections and kind of what this is going to look like. Um, I have down below, and I also have a copy of this for everybody too, but I put this on the slide. If you pass it around. I have a, um, I wanted to put this on the slide so that they weren't in attendance, but at the bottom you can see the proposed route from a really kind of 30,000 foot level. Uh, for the first third of the project or so, it follows along Highway 12 as you go up on the flyover. It's gonna be just to the south of that. And then at a point where it starts to turn and go north of Highway 12, that is, it kind of extends, the, the, the sidewall path continues to go straight and extend it extended MSU campus. I'll let uh, all the former all the business talk a little bit about that. But I wanna just point out that there's really two different sections when this thing gets fully constructed. The first one up on the top is the section that's gonna be right adjacent to Highway 12 in the MPOT right away. And you'll notice that that is an eight foot wide multi-use path. That's the narrowest uh, path width that we can accommodate uh, for it to be a multi-use path. But we had some really um, constraints that we were trying to work through. One being right away of MDOT, we did not want to acquire any right away or get any easements. The second is, if you're familiar with that area, there's quite a bit of topographical issue right there. It kind of drops off. There's a pretty large uh, conveyance channel through there. I think it's the tall creek uh, that goes under the highway. So we were kind of working through some of those concerns. And this is what uh, this is the proposed section that would fit and that would be acceptable to everything. What we would prefer, though, long term, is to have a 10 foot wide path, and that's kind of what, what our standard is and what we've been building around town. And that is kind of what the new the section looks like once you enter, uh, get off of MDOT right away and enter into MSU campus. So we do have a, a short section that's eight foot wide, um, but then it transitions to 10 foot all the way for the remainder of the project. This is an overview of the proposed route that's uh, in, on the last sheet of your handout. Um, this kind of gives you the, the overall view, and I have a kind of an enlarged uh, view of that. It starts at Spring Street, which is the Hampton Inn, is right here in the southeast corner. Um, there is already some existing sidewalk facilities there. There's a crosswalk across Highway 12 at that location. If y'all remember, we did spend some of the MDOT only our funds to enhance that crosswalk and make a crosswalk also across to the Strange Brew corner as well. So this is going to be a really important corner uh, once this project is completed because we're now going to send and dump a lot more bicyclists and pedestrians in this location. So long term, we are in concert or some coordination talks about how can we get the bicyclists 
further to the west along the same side of the, of the highway. And I think that that, again, is just a, a conversation that we'll have to continue with MDI and we're looking at that as part of our overall uh, master of regional transportation study. This is one of the intersections that we're really focused on in that study. So we, like I said, we extend on the south side of the highway. Um, we are separated off of the edge of the roadway there about five feet to provide a buffer, a safety buffer. And then if you remember, if y'all are familiar with this, there's an old, um, all of the said it was installed probably about 75 years ago, old chain link fence that separates the, the roadway from the adjacent properties to, to provide uh, uh, restricted access of that highway. We will be making a break of that fence. We'll have to put some followers there for MDOT's requirements. But at that point, it's going to enter and follow, I guess it's old Highway 12 as it entered in into campus a long time ago, um, with, which is now called 12 Lane. So at that point, you want to take over and talk about how it goes through campus, or you? I can. Yeah. Um, we're hoping when they take a portion of that fence out, they rip up most of it. <laughs> <laughs> but we've been emphatically stated it has to stay as an access control device so that people don't get on the 12 where they're not supposed to. Uh, so the key with any TAP grant is that you have to uh, service two logical termini. So obviously the Hampton Inn and Spring Street is one. And then when you look at the campus, all the activity that happens in the junction and the way those sidewalk networks now go from the center of campus and the drill field toward the amphitheater, we have no connection, sidewalk connection going east or going west from, from that area towards um, Highway 12. And so when you take that into effect and you look at what's been happening on Russell Street and what y'all done on Russell Street University and then what's now happening on Loxley, this kind of is the last portion. Well, it's not the last portion, but we just talked about 182. But this is one of those other key connection points that we see in really breaking that barrier between the campus and the city uh, in accessing or having both bike and pedestrian access through all access ways. Um, so the key here, continue Highway 12, it links into sidewalk systems that are between Fraternity and Sorority Road, makes connections across uh, Bully, what is um, the 12 interchange there, Bully and um, and Sorority Road or Clyde T. Keith Shuley Road, whatever, it's, there's some, actually some confusion in what some of those names are. We're using this project to clean that up. Um, but then it will go along Old 12 again in front of Neil Grissom and then tie into the sidewalk infrastructure that is in place in the amphitheater, ultimately going through the junction and up to the drill field. Um, so that's a very important termini for us. As you can imagine, both with game day traffic, daily traffic, people coming to and from the Hampton are people who, quite honestly, just want to leave campus on a daily basis and walk up. Chick-fil-A or whatever there may be, they now have that option through this this uh, this project. So, good deal, adding on that. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say when we initially put together the cost estimates and the very conceptual plan, which MDOT funded and we got uh, approved uh, funding from, um, to one thing that we did not anticipate and that we did not uh, realize it was going to be required until we started really digging into the details of the design. And I think partly it's because the standards kind of changed midstream too, is we have two signals on this project, one at Spring Street at the Hampton Inn, and then one right here, what I call about a Delta Gamma house uh, on Bully Boulevard. MDOT said, um, once we started getting into the detailed design, that those signals would have to be upgraded to meet the new, um, I think they, they call it the APS system, which is the automated pedestrian signal uh, system that, you know, the, the signals that you hear when you push the button, it kind of chirps at you and tells you kind of when you can walk and don't walk. Well, the, the, that added a good bit of cost to the project, but more than that, it also uh, added a, a lot of time to it because everything related to signalization right now has about a six month lead time once you order that material. There's just a huge backlog uh, from it. So we were initially targeted to be kind of under construction right now is what our goal was to be open for the football season um, this fall. But with that uh, additional requirement and the, the lead time, that actually pushes back. And MHU also had some construction going on adjacent to the path that they had kind of uh, voiced their preference to delay it a little bit too. So those two projects would be in in conflict. So this is our new prop proposed timeline, kind of what we're here today. We're ready to advertise for the project. Um, 
what we want to do is go ahead and advertise for bids. We're going to go ahead and award a contract this fall, which would uh, and a notice to proceed, which would allow the contractor to go ahead and order those materials that take a long lead time. They would do that, and then our idea is that we would commence construction probably around March of 2021 with the goal of being done on, on August 31st, which is right around the time this, you know, the football season would start, but hopefully uh, be, be done shorter than that. Um, that's, so that's kind of our new timeline. NDOT has kind of concurred with that timeline, thinks that it's doable. Um, from a money standpoint, I know all of my sister and everybody's really interested in that, is where are we from a, from a financial standpoint? As y'all know, this is a grant that's funded through MDOT, but it does require a 20% match. Uh, the 20% match is divided three ways, the city, the county, the university. We're required to pay that 20% plus all the upfront engineering design surveying uh, fees as well. But the overall uh, project for the full build out um, is $756,000. Now, one thing that we did do in the in the project is we built in about four different alternates, I believe. And those alternates, depending on how the bids come out, those can be rolled back or, or eliminated, depending on how the bids come back and how that falls into the budget. So we've kind of structured the budget um, to accommodate a little flexibility. We feel like the base bid um, is really uh, pretty close to our target where we are from a budgetary standpoint. But I'll, I'll also say right now, we just don't have any idea how the budget or how the bids will come back. I know MSU um, anecdotally has been receiving some very competitive bids here in the last three months or so. Um, I feel like this will be a pretty attractive uh, project for, some that, for somebody who's really looking for something to extend them through the spring and next summer. So we'll see when those bids come back this fall. But, ge but generally, I think we're in a good spot. We're ready to kind of put it out there on the market and see how the, um, how the contractors respond. Cool. Thank you. Well, let me congratulate you on your new position. Appreciate well done, well deserved. Um, and say that I love the fact that we continue to have this partnership with the county, with MSU, with MDOT. This is just another one of those success stories to me for the city of Starkville as we proceed and go forward um, into yeah, the. Really in Give me small talk earlier because he wanted to talk about the next step. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's all it's all continuous. And I love it. It's yes. great. I mean, this is this is our partnership. This is our community, and I couldn't be um, happier to see us continue in this vein. So, um, anyone have any questions of Mr. Kemp, Ms. Sistrunk? Um, Alderman Walker, any questions of Mr. Kemp? No, ma'am. That's Alderman Baden? Always. Of course you do. <laughs> um, and we'll direct this to either or both of you. Um, when this thing's built, I noticed that on football game day, football games, people park in that grass, <coughs> Bully Boulevard, and, and our, this proposal. Oh, well. Y'all not going to put a y'all not going to put a fence to keep people getting up from there over that thing where they walk on it. On it. We're not. And actually, the design engineer has an apron and a design driveway, an MDOT standard driveway at the north end of, um, I forget the road name, but it goes by Clay Lyle Entomology. Mm -hmm. Wherever that road goes north and tees in the old 12, right. there's a design to drive an apron where the they can still access that grass. It'll be built. The game day standard is they'll do just the rope fencing to keep vehicles from getting on and off, but they'll still use People that. can walk over onto it. Right now they walk in the road. And that's great. So, that's well, that, that will give them a place to park. I mean, uh, it will give them a place to walk with the design also giving an access way for people to be able to park on the other side and continue to park on the grass. And I guess, uh, because this thing stops down at Spring Street. And Spring Street is just a big major intersection that is not pedestrian or bike or anything friendly. And, it, and it's four lane, it's all four lane streets coming in that have first bike path or a pedestrian slash bike path of any type. And, and so I guess there's going to be stuff that we'll plan in the future that this will connect to. It'll be where you just won't drop people off at the corner of the hand. Yes, and our, our matching this is about 50 grand, is that right? I got one. It's going to be actually about closer to 100 because, the again, the preliminary engineering costs right, plus the, the 20%. Okay, thanks. But it's divided by three. But it's divided by three. Yeah. yeah. So, my congratulations. Alderman Vaughn? 
Okay, awesome. I would just say one more quick thing is the university is planning on installing some lighting along the, the route that you were just talking about, the old old 12 is what I call it, even though that's not the name. Um, and that, that is one of the alternates that we're, you know, we're hopeful that the, the project will come back, but that's something that we, from a security and safety standpoint. Not the lighting, the alternate is the, the, the footing. The, the footing, and then image we'll the lighting standards etc the electrical uh, but just the basis of the conduit right. the rest of us okay cool all right thank you so much nice thank to you. see you appreciate yeah. you coming visiting you should come back more often Absolutely. <laughs> all right um all right well with that, that that concludes presentations unless someone has anything they want to discuss about any of those and we can move into our agenda and which is fairly light and we can probably move pretty quickly so um, essentially, what we've got are two sets of minutes, and Mr. Latimer, any of those minutes, any issues? And Ms. Harden is over there on the other side, so all they should be ready to go. Any issues with uh, consent on those? Okay. Um, and then uh, I, there's some some volunteers and some uh, firemen that I intend to spend some time acknowledging um, at the board meeting, but that will be that will be then. Um, this is calling for the first public hearing on adopting a temporary leisure and entertainment district ordinance. Um, that will be in your packet. It's, it is, again, this is an acknowledgement of the issues associated with the pandemic and what it's doing to our restaurants. And there have been a number of cities, Hattiesburg, Tupelo, um, Jackson. Jackson, thank you so much, um, who have adopted this, this temporary uh, leisure and entertainment district, which allows the restaurants, to, the it would be full access to the streetery, for example. That's a compliment there. Yes, it's, it would be a compliment to that. And uh, I, I know we rolled this out a couple of years ago, and it wasn't, and no one was, or it wasn't a majority comfortable with it. It's virtually the same style ordinance with some, the tweaks that uh, Mr. Latimer has put in to uh, create that, the uh, address the new legislation. Is that right? That's right. They changed the legislation between 2017 and now to allow any city to do this. Right. So we updated that language and updated the language a little bit to just uh, put a spotlight on outdoor dining. This helps facilitate that. Of course, as it's drafted now, it can go one step further than that. You can take your drink from the outdoor dining or from an indoor establishment and carry it in the recreation district. Right. And a styrofoam cup or plastic. Well, Mississippi's getting out there, are <laughs> Pushing our limits. We really are. Um, and this is, this is just the call for the first public hearing. So, um, and I'm guessing we're probably not going to be able to get consent on that one. So we'll just let that one, let that one slide. The other one is the tactical urbanism, which Leah showed. And what I would like to do is just have the board support the concept and we will move forward with, with planning that and bring it back as a final concept. Um, and I'll find some money in between now and then I'll go, Pass the hat or something. And, and as, as we're looking at the um, possible other alternatives from the center blocks, mm -hmm. let's be sure we're thinking safety of should a car get loose. Yes, they absolutely. Be, uh, they may yeah. be a little more tolerant. Yeah, and well, and Jason's wheel stop may be we're yeah. closer we'll to where we want to go, but we'll, well. but we will look at that. But what I would like to do is have the board uh, give a thumbs up on considering that as a way to move forward so that we can go ahead and, and start looking at that in a positive way. So. Um, and the other item is uh, adoption of the First Amendment permit uh, process for allowing marches and protests. Okay, so we all know that we were unable to meet what was needed um, at the protest march of last weekend, which, by the way, came out wonderfully. It was a great, it was a great event. Uh, it was a very positive event, um, and I was very proud of Starkville, MSU, and, and all the participants. So let me say that first up. But what it highlighted to me was the fact that uh, we had – our special event permit application, I think, is a good one, um, but it does not meet the requirements that come with the First Amendment spontaneous event, um, immediacy of reactions to national things going on. And so um, I asked Daniel to do some, Mr. Haviland, to do some research on it. Well, I did some research on it, for starters. And then coming, coming up with this as a First Amendment permit opportunity struck me as the way for us to address this so that it could be immediately responded to. Mr. Latimer has gotten into it. Mr. Howland did the did some research and found other uh, places that did address it. And this is this is what I believe is a good way for us to address their ability, anyone's ability, uh, any organization's ability to respond and us to respond quickly and um, effectively to allow them to meet their constitutional um, abilities constitutional rights. So, uh, Chris, do you want to add anything to that? No, other than to say much credit to Daniel for looking at models. Daniel looked at the Washington, D.C. document and the Chicago document 
and and really mirrored this off of those. And as I've looked at this more and more, you know, Mayor, what this really does is just codify or put in the policy language how last week's event took place. Yes. Because really they did that, but it, we just didn't have anything on writing. So this this just provides a notice and structure for that type of an event. Right. It allows them to have this uh, with that short notice. I think we have like we put seven days, seven days in, not working days, just seven days. Um, so a Friday to a Friday, for example. Um, and if we had to call, had to call a special limit, a special uh, call meeting, we could do so. But in essence, it, it allows them to do that and us to be notified and be a participant in the process and making sure that it's safe and, and coordinated in such a way that is best for the community. So that that is what this is. And um, so anyway, just to just to let y'all know where that came from. And we'll have further discussion about it on Tuesday because it's worth talking about some more. So okay. Um, and then beyond that, we have uh, advertising for construction bid for the TAP project, which is what we, I'm sorry, planning special event. Uh, this is the JL King Center to hold a Juneteenth celebration. Um, Ms. Harris has put in her request and we we know that um, uh, special events will not will not be a unanimous so consent is not an option for us but this is for Juneteenth at the uh, JL King Center and they're they're planning in that NAACP is is uh, apparently has a blanket um, insurance that they have that's an annual thing and so this is part of their um, project that they are they are moving forward with and so their insurance will will apply to this which is meets that special event requirement so um, and under under engineering this is the tap project authorization for m dot required paperwork uh, or for me to sign in dot m dot required paperwork any issues with that linkage tap project anyone want to is is that viable for consent for anyone okay all right let's show that one on as consent claim docket um, is is not a consent item and then acceptance of the financials usually works to consent so any issues with that one so may financials consent uh, fire department is uh, and the reason the chief is asking for this is because he's got to do some advance but it will be no con no cost to the city but he's got to pay in advance so that's the request for us but it will end up being uh, at no cost to us so I think that's a, a good item for consent if everyone's in agreement okay and then under parks, we have facility use agreement. This is something, Chris, that you have been working on with Mr. DeQuilla. We have, and, and what we're doing, there are two main agreements that, this, that parks uses, one for tournaments and one for just seasonal play. And so attaching to each of those, we'll have one addendum, which will be our COVID-19 rules and guidelines. And then the other attachment will be a COVID-19 waiver until we get through this COVID-19 time period. Okay. So just rushing up our documents to make sure we're covering COVID-19 as our parks start to open up and tournament play ensues and seasonal play ensues. Well, which takes me to the fact that we are going to have some tournament play coming up. It looks as though we're going to have uh, three tournaments, I believe it is today. Right now, we, we for sure have the state tournament July the 10th for Grand Slam. That one is indefinite. We have another organization that we're working with. We're gonna meet with them Pending approval of this on Tuesday, we'll be meeting with them Wednesday. They've requested two dates from us. We are optimistic that those are both going to happen. Um, it's going to be a matter of whether they can get their teams in and that type of thing. But this is another organization outside of Grand Slam, which as Mayor and I met the other day, moving toward Cornerstone. Um, we want to have as many associations getting acclimated to the how Starkle does tournament. So, uh, we're optimistic that we'll have two more. So, uh, with Fourth of July, we'll have a very busy coming up in the June through the thirty four weeks in July. Yeah, and and that's wonderful. So, getting getting back to some sense of, of having people back in town and, and having tournaments. Well, we've got everybody here. The other thing that we will start, we've got a, a little over two hundred kids that have re-registered for baseball and softball. Uh, we're running that again through next week. We're about uh, two weeks from that starting up, and we'll do that Monday through Thursdays, pretty much for the month of July as well. We'll look to wrap that right before the kids get, get ready to go back to school. So we'll uh, we'll be kind of in full commotion again uh, over the next four to six weeks. Okay, thank you, Alderman Sister. The um the the baseball leagues that, that are going through the recreation department. These are there are no fees associated with this year. We did not charge any fees. We, we do not look probably to administer the uniforms that were pre-purchased. Um, and if we have any cost, it'll be to put one umpire on the field with some of the older age groups. 
with Coach Pitch, Steve Ball, we'll let the coaches self officiate. There will be no tournaments, no all stars. It is, for all intents and purposes, it's a little bit more of a true recreational league this year. Go out, have a good time, get an opportunity to get out and play. Um, use it as coaching opportunities and teachable moments. If somebody does something wrong, we'll stop play and, and let the kids learn. It'll, it'll be a little bit more of a soft approach on baseball this year. And you said you'd have people re register, but if there are people who didn't register previously they or are interested, still, they can register. We, we, to my knowledge, we had one or two, still loose Chuck and Lisa can attest this, one or two loose refunds, and we, but I think we finally have all of our refunds for everybody cleared up. So anybody that did pay previously has been refunded their money. And if you want to register right now, it's an open registration and no calls. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I would say that is that uh, consent for everyone? No problem. Okay. And then uh, last but not least, under the utilities department, we've got uh, driveway repair on Stark Road and then uh, Garver for construction services. Anything that you want to share about that, Terry? Um, okay. All right. Any, anyone have any questions about either of those? Okay. Um, consent for those. All right. All right. That takes us down to executive session. We've got a couple of matters that will, that will be under executive session, um, but obviously we'll be talking about them now. So, if anything else for anyone to discuss, any thoughts? All right. Well, we will uh, then adjourn the meeting, and we will look forward to. It. See you on Tuesday evening. Have a great weekend. Thank you, everyone. Good session, everybody. Thanks for all the presentations. Appreciate it. Yeah.